So I'm gonna start the video a bit earlier and explain how, my god, <laughs> I sh just did a first take and realized I turned off all my Bluetooth sources throughout my entire house. And that was because I went through the whole phase of like being like, you know, very anti Bluetooth. And it's pretty funny because I had all this like, un I felt like an idiot for like a good hour just figuring out how to reconnect each individual Bluetooth device over again. So now I'm actually a opponent to Bluetooth again. I like my Samsung Buds, my AirPods are okay, my, those sound better with, Air, with iPhones, Samsung sound better with um, Galaxies, it's kind of weird. But yeah, I do appreciate the fact that they do have, you know, DSP and DAC villain. Battery life could work better. Um, I like that they thought ahead and made it so you can connect multiple devices at once. Samsung did that first. Apple followed, but only allowed the A chip. Or sorry, the M chip, I believe. Eh, M chip? W chip? To work. And so oh, only Bose and AirPods can connect multiple to iPhone. So if you have an iPhone or iPad, and you want to watch a movie and you're bringing your gear onto a plane don't be disappointed like we were and don't expect multiple bluetooth um airpods or earbuds to connect to a movie especially a computer because it won't work you're gonna end up doing what we have to do which wasn't too bad we ended up connecting it to a fold and then using um two of our um Galaxy Buds and it connected seamlessly and it could connect seamlessly with anything basically as far as like multiple Bluetooth devices at once Which is pretty rad because now I'm able to do this demo where I'm actually connected to all the Bluetooth um, Sources in my house now that I've just reactivated them <laughs> So Back to square one. Why is it that? audio Sounds not so lifelike when it's coming out one speaker. There's a point in time when the word speaker used to actually be synonymous with the word tannoy. Kind of like the way, like, you know, in the 90s, like, you know, skateboards for retards were called, snow, were called um, rollerblades. Well, back in, like, the days when, of, like, intercoms, when industrial intercoms were becoming more commonplace, they were called tannoys. And Tonoi was very, like, they were pretty much like the king of, you know, making high resolution klaxons or high resolution sirens, you know, as opposed to just everything going or it would actually say enter eight four seven or gate fourteen is to your front, and it would be pretty clear, it worked pretty well, and these were mono, however, and they were meant to be scattered across the ceiling. So this was like a whole prior generation. Even to the point where, in this generation, gramophones still existed, which were also mono. And those amplify things in a completely Edwardian sense, using no electricity, just using the acoustics of a horn, which is rad. That's very rad. I wish I had a gramophone. But anyway, we use horns still to this day, and we call them waveguides and horns. And the two are basically very similar, but they're kind of just defined by whatever the heck they're used for. And some people just call one the other. This one, and while others are called the other guy a bullshitter. So let's go ahead and do the experiment. As you approach the speaker, I'm gonna pause until there's some more vocals, okay? There you go, vocals. So why is it that at around this point it kind of sounds pretty convincing? Sounds smaller. I would say that 99% of people would be convinced this isn't a real singer. That it's a speaker. It's a mechanical facsimile. And why is that? As I back up the dispersion becomes wider, right? Just like a camera lens. And you want to see something cool? Um, 
This is pretty much how you work a camera lens. It's the same way as you would focus a cardboard mic. Wide angle shifts the lens so that it's actually more fisheye than zoom in, which is more like a polar radiation, if you kind of think about it. It's literally taking a pocket. My hand right now is tracing an arc, right? It's not tracing a line, it's tracing an arc. You have to remember that it's going away from me. It's not going in a straight line, it's going away from me. So when I am going from here to there, and I zoom in, I'm actually capturing this arc. So yeah, I'm just doing a little bit of like some comparisons between audio and video in case there's any audio geeks out there that might, you know, find this engaging. And I'm trying to make this as engaging as possible. So I'm listening to this through stereo, the way that our ears would hear it, and it's a monophonic sound source. And I'm using Bluetooth because Bluetooth, although um, I used to not like it, and I'm still kind of in between about it. And still, it has cool features like this. You know, you can actually like you know adjust the on the fly, adjust the balance and stuff like that. So you can do a cool test with it. So, as far as I am, just like in the tunnel, it kind of does increase its fidelity. I'm gonna use that word. It sounds more realistic, because that's what fidelity means. Oh, sorry, I got a notification. That's another issue with, um, Bluetooth is that you have to shut off your notifications in order to freaking not interrupt your freaking video. Cut. Okay. And I guess through the magic of Bluetooth. I'm doing the last mod. Get rid of. There. Do not disturb. There. Stupid freaking notifications. Okay, and there's a treat for you. That's Mocha. He's like three years old. And he's still kicking. Kicking ass, actually. But anyway, let's go back to um, Spotify. I'll pause. Fast forward. Okay, back to where we were. So why is it that when I back up, you can say that it does sound more convincing, right? <clears throat> the sound dispersion is wider, so you can tell that I'm hearing more of the resonance of the room, and the, the sound dispersion of the speaker is wider, so it's kind of scaling up more. The same way that, like, you know, a magnifying lens scales up sound. Sorry, a magnifying lens scales up light with a projector. Um, this is operating with the same principle, where it's dispersing the sound more broadly, and I also get the added benefit of the sum of all the sound around me. So I get the sound from the speaker and the resonance of the room around me. The reverb of the room around me. All good stuff. So let's go ahead and do a pause and switch. Okay, so this is actually a very unfair comparison. These speakers get all flack and I want to actually kind of do a series covering these because they're made to be used very differently than every other speaker and they're tested like every other speaker and I find that very unfair. And so I started, you know, brewing for the underdog and I kind of like these speakers for what they are. But, being as I've said, I didn't connect so well for them. So they are going to sound thinner, so we don't judge them. They're the underdog. But, I'm doing the same thing here where I'm gonna be going forward. Awakening is clear. I could show you how. I could show you how to me, I can already hear somewhat of the design of the speaker doing its job. Where it's actually using the boundary gain of the wall 
almost like it's a gigantic wave diet in the sense. Almost as if this whole entire wall here is a wave guide. <laughs> it's like a indented part of the baffle with lower pressure air that's more sensitive. So just with, um, I had a pair of logstick um, C3, C4, they're the candy bar ones with like the full range of the center, um, inverted dome, a jar on top, a jar on the bottom. Probably the last like fantastic logstick scissors I've ever had. Just for the hell, these guys had these freaking since I was like 16. I don't know, I'm about with time. Between 16 and 26, I'd say. <laughs> so these, like with the Logitech, when I first got them, I just, that was before I really got into audio. And I noticed that when I placed them up against the wall, they sounded phenomenal. There's something wrong with them. I had to use some blue tack to get them to like, you know, not rattle. But placing a speaker up against the wall does have its benefits. But a speaker has to be designed in order to actually accommodate for that. This speaker is designed to accommodate for being designed for a speaker. When I get close to it, it sounds remarkably big. I'm not trying to review the speaker right now, by the way. I'm going to turn it down. Oh, I'm not to like bust into review. <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to turn down the review. We're going to melt. God, I'm having so many different things at once. So you hear again, hear how the closer you get with these, actually, these are just like the rest, actually. Because these somehow, because of the fact that they're placed up against a wall, manage to actually break that illusion better than any other speaker I've ever seen. And this is something that, this is not stage, by the way. I'm not trying to sell these things. I'm not even going to name the brand anymore. But, um, yeah, for some reason when I'm up close to it, it actually seems to work just as convincingly. <laughs> I thought it was something I just created in the test. But nonetheless, if I were to walk through the wall, I'm sure that the illusion would break down. So let's just go and try that real quick. That didn't happen. So, I'm backing up. So I'm actually kind of setting this up as my studio room. So I got a few just stand and all over stuff all the way. But watch as I back up. The dispersion broadens, right? As with anything, right? Like the same way that a projector causes light to be dispersed. The projector records light from a 3D environment pours it into a 2D frame and then projects it out projects it out but through a lens. And that lens is able to restore the picture to its same, you know, lack of wonkiness because the lens has distortion, you know. That's why those old TVs just have to have to be like round and stuff. But anyway, um, the technology is able to make it so that the output is more once button with the input. Especially with DLP, DLP technology is what I chose, where it actually ends up like basically flinging light beads at the wall versus like flinging, versus filtering L, C, and G like filters of light against like a small screen so that the light would be filtered versus light being thrown. I like light being thrown. Anything that's thrown to me is cool. Okay, so anyway, back to these figures. Comparison. Backing up far away, it sounds more convincing. Going from side to side to side, I would say these are probably like up there with the most convincing speakers I've ever heard in mono. The sound, like the illusion doesn't seem to break down when you, when you walk up close. Shoot! Did I just like destroy my own entire like freaking initiative here? No, I don't think so. Because there's a very, very specific event for a speaker. 
to the point where there are negative reviews of the speaker because people refuse to put them on a wall. And then Cat has to create like this system where you have to like put them on a special stand and then set them so that the crossover is different. So that they would be used as regular speakers, but they were never intended to be used as regular speakers. They're always intended to be used using using boundary gain. And boundary gain, as you know, the same way that crossover gain works, boundary gain causes not only low end um, boost, but it causes boost at the crossover range. Crossover range is where you have the same tones happening between the tweeter and the woofer. So typically, you'd want to slope the tweeter and the crossover range so that they both kind of sum kind of even. But when you have boundary gain, you actually don't want to do that because then you end up with extra bright. Um, that region ends up extra bright, which is where we came. Look up the term BBC dip, and even the Odyssey default curve. The reason why that exists is because. Let's do another comparison. Alright, so these are two way speakers designed to reinforce the boundaries of the walls so that it is able to <coughs> take the crossover region between the tweeter and the woofer, reinforce it so that the sum is smooth and it ends up sounding pretty good. And also, by being backed up against the wall, the speaker sound is actually a lot bigger than it should. Which is pretty rad. Because they actually, to me, sound bigger than the LS50s, which I didn't expect. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm just close to them right now. And they still sound roughly pretty big. They didn't do the shrinking effect. So, let's go ahead and start. Let's go ahead and strip them over to stereo and see how they sound then. And it's just fun we have time to talk about boundary game a little bit. I'll keep it short. So bam! Magic of stereo! <laughs> so now I'm standing in the going right uh, going triangle again. Sound test! Sound test! Sound test! Sound test! Okay. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, so... I'm in the golden triangle right now. That means that... There's an equilateral triangle between me, the speaker, and the distance between the speakers. That's what people in the industry, in the biz, call the golden, um, the golden triangle. Because it's one of those kind of like, you know, things you... It's a magic number, essentially. It's a, it's a magic geom geometrical concept, and it since it's magical, it's applicable everywhere. So then... People just use it everywhere. So the magic triangle is very useful. If everyone records with the magic triangle, everyone can then reproduce sounds with the magic triangle at the point. And so when I'm here, I'm still limited to the same limitations of stereo. This sounds very convincing, right? Let's see what happens when I walk close. Yeah. It's starting to break down. So the stereophonic sound is breaking down. Even though I would say that the T series does not sound as if it shrinks as much as the LS50s do. Which I found remarkable. And honestly, I mean even for these like being up close, I would if I were to mount these like flanking my monitors, they'd be pretty rad. 
But I don't know. I maybe not. No, I do not do that. Do not do that. Do not quote me. Um, they, I think, have to be. They have to be connected to the back wall. They have to be connected to that plane that never works. But you can see how. Watch. Listen. Golden Rick. Golden Triangle. Damn weird! Golden Triangle. And the Golden Triangle is actually always more forgiving when you back up. Because a triangle can continue being a triangle. You know, even when it becomes an isosceles triangle. Get the point? Now I'm trying to draw in math on uh, geometry geeks. Which I utterly failed at, I'm sure. Because the triangle has, you know, a more pointed point. When it's an isosceles triangle versus a golden triangle. You know? Yeah, so, something about the two channel stereo, especially at the golden triangle and behind, even when I'm at different angles, it all sounds better. And again, what I hear is a sound stage. Something's happening in between, a phantom, so to speak. Something like the singing tunnel phantom aforementioned. So between the speakers, each of these speakers are hearing, are reaching my ears, where this one is clearly reaching my right ear first, this one's clearly reaching, reaching my left ear first. So even if this one does manage to cross, this one manages to cross, this ear already has dibs on that, this ear already has dibs on that, and we hear with our minds and not with our ears. So it doesn't matter. It already knows what it's hearing and already rendered the soundscape accordingly and it's made its mind. It knows that the left channel is the left channel and the right channel is the right channel. And I'm gonna prove that er like later on even with like a very very thin example of stereo. That I think you'll find interesting. So yeah. The issue is still apparent nonetheless. So because I wanna show the limitations of stereo just as much as I wanna show you like how cool it is, right? So, with um, stereo, of course, yeah, when you pass the point of no return, passing the point of the phantom, you break the illusion, right? But backing up, it works, and you start hearing more of the room resonance, and you start just hearing more general, like that cardio shape I was describing, right? It's like, it's like obviously, this thing going to have like 100% cardio dispersion, like there's absolutely nothing going on behind it. So like... It's just pretty much a, a, a diamond dispersion. <laughs> like, it, there's, it's a flat back, and then everything else would just be like doing this, doing this, and then this other one would be doing this, and doing this. And they're both facing forward, so the sum of the sound is here, but it's all just reflecting along the side walls, which is causing the whole entire room to resonate, which gives. Um, the difference between reverb and resonate are very subtle. Reverb is usually used as a good thing. Like, it's used by musicians. You add a bit of reverb to vocals to make it sound more full. A reverb is basically the sum of all reflections. And it's usually considered just like a way of making your vocals sound better. Like when you're singing in like a bathtub or a um, shower. I only sing in bathtubs, but if you sing in a shower, or you're singing in a tunnel. You're, it it kind of makes your um, vocals sound fuller because of that slight bit of fullness of the slight bit of echo behind it coming from the reflections all around you ends up actually like almost as if you had a whole bunch of wolves all singing like the same exact tone where it would just sound like like the uber wolf or something you know like it would just sound like the most like resonant wolf in the universe but wolves that i actually mentioned later on i think wolves actually choose 
in nature, and this is how common all these weird biohacks are. <clears throat> Just like animals, even insects will make false faces on them to trick predators. Wolves will actually choose different pitches across the auto spectrum to help to increase the sound of their presence. So a single wolf will start, a second wolf will actually start with a second harmony, a second har a harmony. A third wolf will not sing the first or second harmony, even though that's what he would have started with. So sing a third harmony. Or so sing a fourth harmony. Or so sing a fifth harmony. And it all stacks and it ends up creating this cacophony of just howls that sounds like you're gonna die. It sounds like what the bagpipe was designed for, right? It was to make the sound of a banshee, a banshee so that a bunch of people painted that would, you know, fear no death because they are only wearing a layer of paint and nothing more are coming at you and so you must run because they clearly fear no death. And so they're clearing back they're carrying bagpipes and those are the screechings of the shaman or, or the, oh, sorry, the um, banshee. So the wolves do the same thing. They know they evolve to actually howl in a way that actually isn't like a single wolf all singing the same tone. Because if they did that, it's all sound like it's just one wolf. One wolf would like, you know, like it would be like the baby, like the, you know, like the, the very man of little wolves or something with the. A, a, a wolf with like the voice of God or something, or the voice of an angel. <laughs> but yeah, wolves don't do that. They sprawl their singing so that it actually spreads as wide of a frequency as possible, and then it sounds like a larger pack. And it's able to both cause cause more reflections, and it's able to fool your mind into thinking there's just a shit ton of wolves. All around you, because their wolves will resonate across the whole entire freaking forest, right? And the wolves are also very high pitched, so as they go out, they're pretty much like, you know, making sure that they're fucking you as much as possible. Because <laughs> that's pretty much like, you know, as, as far as our ears, they will attract things when something like shifts in tune continuously. That's messing with your Doppler shift. So when they go out, and they're coming at you, that's like pretty much it compensating for it killing you. The same way that like you know, a train, as it's approaching you, goes as it, you know, lowers its pitch and sadness as it kills you. So, the stereo song, right? Is the magic that I'm trying to explore here that seems to make it so that somehow when you do collapse it back to stereo, it just doesn't really seem to work as well anymore. It's just this one doesn't scale down. The version's the same. I would say it's still the same kind of diamondist version. You know, I'm going this way. It sounds even. But it still doesn't sound convincing. And I think we all know why, right? It's because it's not stereophonic. It's not 3D. I'm hearing one sound and my ears are battling to make sense out of it. So it'll never sound real. So even if it did resonate so that it could actually resonate the tunnel, where my ears can hear, you know, different imperfections in the tunnel and make out two different kind of sound sources, even though it is still one sound source, I, it still wouldn't really necessarily sound like the original singer himself. Maybe if I wiggle the speaker back and forth to kind of art, you know, like how to simulate the idea of it having two perspectives. I don't know. Yeah, but either way, a single speaker just does not actually make a sound space inside your mind. But there are speakers too. So 
So let's go and try another one. You might think that these are a size thing, right? Let's do a full size, a full size one. Soft sizes. I'm gonna start in the center. So this is actually a floor sander, which means that it could actually cover the full human range, just like the LS50s could, but it's actually a huge speaker. So they're going to play much lower. Okay. So this is like a, you know, a house rocking speaker. I'm not proud of it because like, I modded it out of like the higher end version to make a more compact model. And I thought the more higher end version was like too big and all spacious and too heavy. And I love the way these sound. I don't have a sober sound by the way. So these are just working with um, the dual woofers on the bottom and the unicorn top. And I'm a cat fanboy. That's not trying to I learned a lot from them. But let's try the experiment now. I would say this sounds probably more like an actual live vocal performance than any other one before. More than Alice Fifties. It actually sounds too scale. Is that the backup? I could convince myself if I was like, I don't know, let's say I was like inebriated enough or something like that. I might actually start, you know, hitting up that speaker and being like, hey, you got some pipes on you, babe. Because I always talk. Add just like a gap before babe every single time. And that's what kills it. But you, you, should, you guys should always try it though. Always add a gap before babe when you're hitting up a girl or a guy or either or neither. So out of all the speakers, this floor standard does manage to actually render a fuller sound. And to me, it actually does sound the most convincing in a mono. Oh, shit, that is a mono right now. In, in, in a mono setting. It's not very tight up against the back wall. And it's, it's tuned with a support facing forward, so... It is tuned to be accommodating to the back wall, but it's not really attached to the back wall. It's separated. So let's start going toward it. <laughs> tune speakers is that you actually want to make sure that the top speaker, the tweeter, which is considered one way, two way, three way, right? This plays the upper frequencies, um, I know, around like, usually between 2k and 3k, which is unfortunate because that's actually where our ears are most sensitive, so it's between 3k and 5k, 5k is where our ears are most sensitive. So dropping below 3k or 2k, I mean, would actually be a great idea for everyone, guys. But I don't know why, yeah, in the future they're gonna do that. But, so the tweeter is crossed, I think, at like 2.8, but it, it's crossed as a slope, so that the woofer picks up as the frequency drops and then fills up for where the tweeter can no longer tweet anymore. The woofer used to be called a squawker because. This is called a worker. And so I started using the word squawker too, because I like it. So the woofer, sorry, woofer, squawker, tweeter. Get it? Tweet, tweet, squawk, squawk, woof, woof. Sub, woof. Okay. So the tweeter crosses 
number 28k, which is very fast, very fast. So it goes all the way up to like 40k, down to 28k, but it can't go any lower than that because it'll start distorting, it's too small. So with air pressure, it'll blow up, right? So if this thing was required to play all the way down to this, it would literally just explode. But instead, we have it crossed over before it's first port distortion to the cone. The cone has more surface area and it's more capable of handling the mid-range. The mid-range is then crossed over at 28k so that there's a handoff. Between the handoff of the 28k, the tweeter and the roof are actually playing the same frequency. And this is what I was saying I was going to get to earlier. This is what causes what was called the BBC. Do you see dip or the mid-range compensation, mid-range compensation dip, the Odyssey has, or the, the, um, Arnie New, New Dell dip. Lots of dips, right? And that happened at the top of the And there's a lot of reasons that, to me, sound like, I don't know why we just don't just come up with a single answer, because the answer to me is so pretty obvious. It's playing the whole entire range, right? But when they do play the same range and you have a reflection, what happens? The tweeter ends up a tweeter and the woofer playing at around twenty between you know twenty and three thousand, which is where our ears are most sensitive, are also reflecting also re reflecting off the side walls. So now you have the sound of the tweeter and the woofer playing like let's say um 3k right where like you know you're you're you would want to die because that's like the, the sound of, the, of nails on chalkboards if someone was to subject you to that so 3k is happening and the crossover region, region, the woofer and the tweeter are both playing at the same exact time because that's a crossover. And they are actually passing off the baton, but they're still in the crossover region. So they are both still handling 3K. Put it there side wall, and now you double that. Because now you're hearing the tweeter, the woofer, both doing 3K, and you're hearing the tweeter and the woofer over here also doing 3K. So that's four sources of 3K stacked immediately. And between the friggin' speakers, let's say you have them like close together, you have this speaker, this speaker, this speaker, this speaker, and then the other speaker, all summed. And let's say you had another wall on that side. So now you have literally four speakers, eight sounds, eight, sorry, eight sounds, all playing at 3K at once. And you don't think that'll be a problem? And yeah, so that's where the whole idea of the 3K came from. I'm sorry, the BBC dip came from. They realized that like, in the, in the cross of the region between which happens to you and your father between 2 and 3k. What is the exception of these guys? These guys actually managed to dig down to 1.8 with their massive like freaking 1.25 tweeter, which is pretty amazing since I have no mega tech. Astrid, Astrid. Um, yeah, so when this thing was designed, Tess was originally a boundary company. There is a Kent Engineering Boundary, right? So they were really good at making metals and materials and poly, etc. It was like an age of like when, you know, when people say stupid stuff like, oh, the um, plastic, it's the internet of the future. They probably didn't, they probably didn't use the internet. Something else. But you know, but yeah, plastic did actually produce some pretty cool stuff out of like the, the waste of petrol, right? So from the waste of petrol, we end up producing all sorts of cool stuff. Like, you know, this cone right here is titanium coated, right? Which is very cool. This rubber right here is rubber, which is a natural, a natural synthetic material. This right here is plastic. This is paper composite. It's not like the same way that like, American dollars are made out of paper composite. Same thing. And then 
this Arctic Rubber Fence has a cool shaped port that's flared and it's flared so that it's kind of like a, a lift but smiling so that it actually helps reduce any internal ringing so Tesla design because they had Tesla they could be commissioned by the UC to create the first studio broadcast monitor and that was the good idea Okay, so what? Here we are all listen through the radio. <laughs> so they commissioned a box called the L35As, which then everyone could have. It would be small, it could fit in any cramped circumstances, it'd be very forgiving to play spin, and anyone could use it. It had very, very, very um, high sensitivity. Um, it would work on any amp. It was just, it was actually a very, just very 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 good speaker and um, people nowadays still spend like I think 10 G at least for one of the original pairs which they, they only made like 10 thousand of the original licensed versions since they're only meant for industrial use and then Kev went on and, and started making speakers and actually started selling literally like pretty much the same exact thing made out of plastic on top and on bottom was a low frequency section so that then it would be the like LS35A in your own home. But with a low frequency section. But hey, get this. There's caster wheels on the bottom. So they could roll it into your home. So yeah, so they made this gigantic, you know, low frequency section. This is before silvers existed. And it made it so that the original student monitors were very, very good at audio. And they're very, very good at sounding very not fatiguing. How did the BBC dip? They tuned the thing by ear. And due to the fact that there were lateral reflections and some reflections uh, at the crossover region, they added a dip between 3 and 5k. And in different incarnations, you know, as far as, you know, like when different people were licensed, like Falcon and Rogers, etc., they started playing with the dip more or less. But you can still see the dip actually now in the LS50s. Um, the dip in general is not, a good, is not a bad idea. And if you really wanted to, you can EQ it out. <laughs> you can EQ it up. It's, it's actually called the brightness region. You can EQ it back up. There's even a crossover mod that's actually not hard to do where you can just change out like a, like a capacitor, you know, like bring back the, it'll bring back the, the, the smooth frequency response versus having it look like more like a one-to-one -one model of the LS35As, which I'll remind you is actually much harder to do than to make a straight line. Have you ever traced the line versus drawn a straight line? Tracing the line is harder than drawing a straight line. So the LS350s are actually like much harder to do and make an authentic sound that sounds very similar to the LS35As, and that's kind of what makes them cool. And that's what you just heard. Those make very, very good vocal monitors, but Kef in general have always tried to perfect the mid-range. So regardless, this speaker here, no matter how big it is, it still doesn't sound like as much as I want it to. I would say this is probably, it's probably pretty convincing too. Like, it, it kind of sounds like a midget to me right now, but he still sounds very much like he is a person standing in the corner singing his heart out. And as I back up, he kind of stands up with me, which is kind of cool. And that's like some fancy baffle or flare, like this version worked for there. This is actually called the sit down up down test. <laughs> that's where, like, based off of the way they handle, like, the tweeter and the wave guy. It's whether or not the dispersion is even enough. And side by side, the dispersion is pretty damn good too. It's really even. But, see as I back up, it actually sounds more convincing. But again, there's a point at which when I get, when I come close, I see the horizon. Go behind the green thing. It was a breakdown for multiple reasons, right? Just like the LS50. Come back out, the LS50. 
These were actually designed as a reboot or the revivification using all new technology to try to get the sound of the LS35As all over again. It's a small box that could capture the human voice, male and females, female or otherwise, and have it sound as lifelike and vivacious as possible. Nevertheless, when I come close to it, I no longer can be a baby but It sounds so unreal. The only difference is that the floor stander actually sounds bigger. So yeah, as a general rule, floor standards do actually sound fuller and bigger. And that's kind of a cheat because, you know, it's like the top section is meant to play the highs and the mids. And it's able to cross over so that at a distance, out of, on the vertical plane, right? You actually hear the tweeter, the, the, the woofer, and the, sorry, the tweeter, the squawker, or the mid woofer, and the low frequency woofer, all in a line. And since they're all crossed over, where this is going from what, like 40k down to 28k, this is going from 28k down to some like 280k, and then this is going from 280k down all the way down to the floor literally there's the floor so literally okay so um that crossover is done by having so that each of the drivers are able to blend as seamlessly as possible so that when you do play a pitch sweep from you know 40k or 20k all the way down it doesn't go it goes, Ooh. you want it to be a smooth, con consistent volume um, change in, in pitch as it lowers. And, and that's why people add solo first and cross them over at around well, like 80 to 120. And then you get, get your solo to play down to like ridiculously, I would say unnecessary stuff like 11 hertz for some reason, which is literally 11 beats a second. I've gotten my heart to beat 11 more than beat 11 beats a second before, so I don't know, whatever. Um, so when you're actually staying too close to this thing, it does break down the illusion because what's happening is that although it's true that you are suffering the same deficit as with the, the LS50s, we're standing too close to this ends up cupping the sound inward and then makes the sound smaller, right? Because no longer is it sprawling, no longer is it reflecting from the walls. You just hear the tweeter and the woofer directly. It probably would sound better if I did this, because at least like the tweeter would reflect off of here, and that makes sound a little bit bigger. But the closer you get, the smaller it gets to the point where it breaks down the illusion, for mono at least, right? Especially when it comes to floor centers, which typically do fare very well for mono at a distance because of the sum of the fact that the, this four way design the tweeter, the, woof, the squawker, and the woofers are all crossed over evenly so that it could play all the way from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows so convincingly that it sounds like it's one unified unit. And that makes it sound just so much more. Um, realistic into scale than like a notebook that has to cram everything into just you know this region right here this can sprawl the entire region so that you know voices and highs come from here and chestiness it's like the jab of the speaker this right here is like the uppercut of the speaker yeah so basically like this is like the chesty voice and this is like the rumble and this is the mouth and this would be the um, chest voice, the diaphragm. It technically is called a diaphragm, but you sing from your diaphragm, right? Is what your teacher tells you. So um, the tweeter is placed in the center, and in this specific configuration, the tweeter and the driver around it are a mid 
concentric array is what it's called, which is different than a lot of other drivers you'll see because most drivers have it so that the tweeter is above or below the um, mid for the squawker. But this one is unique because it has like, it's called the uniqueue because it's unique. It's, and also because Q means like a line. So it's like a uni Q, right? So that the sound from both are in a Q. So um, the woofer and the tweeter, if you stand too close to it, it kind of breaks down the illusion, just like with the LS50s, nonetheless. Yeah, and that's, and the reason why it was actually able to hold it more successfully was because it had more body to it because of this and this. And it was taller, I'm sure. So this the sound field that was coming out of it, it was very it was very very well crossed over and it sounded like a continuity. And so all the sound that was coming out of it was coming out of like this column of sound coming out of me. Right? And it was dispersing like this. Versus just like dispersing like this. Like the other figures I was showing you. And that will inherently sound, you know, like bigger and more um lifelike I guess in a mono setting at least because in a way if you think about it this is kind of stereo because think about it this way high end and mids actually travel faster and reach ears faster than low end does anyone who's ever played on stage knows this because the bassist always has to know that Whatever he hears from the back wall is not the sound that he's playing and do not play to that rhythm or he will be the death of us all because the sound it takes for the bassist to actually hear himself not from the PA but from the actual back wall is the slowest out of everyone else. So he has to just play along with the drummer. That's what he's trained to do. The drummer has hi-hats has a full like accompaniment of textures and things that will just make damn sure to snap them back into time, right? So like drum and bass groups, drum and bass grooves exist because they work together. Like the drum is basically like the tone, the voice of, I'm sorry, the drum is like the fricatives, the consonants, the f three through eight K region of, the human voice, whereas the bass is pretty much like the tone of the human voice. So together, they play when in sync. They sound really good together, very tight. And above that, you have the guitars, you have every other instrument, there's a whole sheet of it. And that tends to be stuff that is very high frequency. There's a reason why in like a symphony, they're going to suddenly have a guy like so, you know, their their prima donna girl or whatever, like burst out and she's gonna pull out her violin. It's not. It's never gonna be like you know, like a viola or a cello, right? It's a violin. It's like a high instrument, right? And then she's gonna start squealing and like going crazy, because like you can hear it cut above everyone else, and she's probably even gonna like deliberately cut above everyone else because it's a fretless instrument, and it's gonna make it so that everyone gets more excited. There's more energy in the air, right? And that's because high energy is, sorry, um, high frequencies are more high energy. They're actually made out of smaller wavelengths. And smaller wavelengths actually register in your ear more rapidly. And since stereo sound happens to occur based off the difference between what one ear hears and what, what the other ear hears, and then what your mind constructs out of that, when you have someone that comes out with something that would otherwise be like a whole bunch of you know drums and like um a whole bunch of people playing brass instruments together or whatever and then you have like this viol single violinist linus come up and just start like you know wailing away it's gonna captivate you because it just sounds so much more different and it's gonna strike your ear like everything else becomes basically just like like her shadow everything else becomes her, her sound stage and then from there, she is able to use the fact that she's playing a higher pitched instrument to basically cover up everything else and everything else becomes a harmonic of her. She's the lead instrument now. And her 
sound will always reach your ear faster than everything else. And that's the point. So the same reason why this is happening here is that these speakers, you'll notice, has a tweeter that's actually receded. And then you have a woofer that's like, you know, goes like that. These woofers also follow the same exact geometry. This tweeter, you really pay attention, is actually a good, like, solid, um, see what, three inches behind? So, that tweeter and that woofer, if they're both blast the same exact signal of 3K at me at the same time, that tweeter hit me, in the, hit me first, always, every single time. Because, well actually no, um, in this case, it would be a time aligned because that's why the tweeter is behind it. But if, let's say, if this tweeter was mounted on this baffle and this woofer was mounted on this baffle, so it was fair, the tweeter would always hit me first because the energy coming from the tweeter is much lower frequency and it takes a lot less energy to start that tweeter than it does to actually start this whole entire mechanism, the more inertia, to play at 3K. And so the tweeter would hit my ears faster and it would actually cut through the mix faster and I would hear it first. So in a way, this is a type of stereo, like a tonal stereophony. It's almost like a Doppler stereophony. So the crossover, like I was saying before, has to be even. And that's what you have to do when you do a perfect speaker. And you also have to time align it. And that's what I was mentioning before, how timing is like the most important thing ever. And the only way you can tell the difference between an echo and like um, the original is because of timing, right? Is because like if the echo and the original didn't have, you know, a good sense of rhythm, then you would be spooked out because that clearly isn't an echo. That's someone patrolling you. An echo should, you know, always be on beat, even when the two stones. Both you'll hear both those sounds and you'll hear both their echoes and there will be syncopations of each other. And the crossover here being smooth is actually just as as important as the crossover between here and there being smooth. Which is just as important as the crossover between here and there being smooth. And that's what stereo sound is. Stereo sound is the crossover of this whole entire channel and that whole entire channel in such a way that it's smooth and doesn't have any sort of extraneous sound that would cause your ears to hear anything outside of what was intended. And you would then be expected to sit somewhere like this. Sorry, like I was saying, I'm sitting in my studio. So yeah, you're expected to sit somewhere like this where, you know, the middle, the middle speaker is. And that would be in the golden triangle. I'm going to pause for a second. You're back. Okay, so yeah, so the center and the mains, right? So I'm in the golden, so usually whenever you set up a room, you want to make sure that everything is pretty much like you're inside a music instrument. That's how it works. Like you, like for example, this closet here, okay? If this closet here was a hallway, imagine that. Imagine that this closet was a tunnel. And then we were to actually isolate it and realize that the tunnel is actually resonant at, um, I don't know, 60 hertz. We just somehow figure that out. It happened to be exactly that, right? And so we were to do a sweep so that now all the air inside the room is all the air we have to work with, right? Let's pretend that we have the doors closed. By the way, um, just like with anything else, when you open the doors, you actually allow for more air, which actually allows for more um, lower end extension. Same way that, you know, woodwinds work or in general, brass instruments work. Things with holes, ocarinas, all those things work. Um, so keep your doors open. But if you were to close all the doors and close all the windows, we don't have the same amount of air in here to work with, right? Except for we'd have a pocket of air receded inside of the closet. That means that whenever the bass would be dipping down to any frequency that is resonant with the air inside the, the, the closet, suddenly it would now have more air to work with than 
in any other frequency range. And that is a problem, actually. It's actually kind of a solution, but it's also a problem in most people's cases. So what you would do is you would start filling your closet with like outer season wear or just anything fluffy. Just just fill it. Just put it, everything like, you know how like you have just crap in your house that like you, you think that you're going to like get rid of? Well, treat it like purgatory, like it's limbo. Besides that, out of season clothing, get a bunch of hangers, blankets for guests, put that over the top, just towel them. Um, anything to basically make it so that that cabinet, that, that space there is no longer a space. So it no longer has the actual acoustics of a space. This here has a space, if you want to believe it. Just like this here has a space. If I were to listen through this port, I could actually hear it. And you know how much it matters? Kev knows how much it matters. Because look. There's actually a steel chamber here. A steel chamber here. And then that's the floor, right? Look carefully at what I just demarcated. Let me see if I can turn up the lights a little bit. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Ooh, a little tangerine we've got. It was pretty cool. Um. That right there is one section. That right there is one section. So you can see that it's not quite one to one, right? And it's not quite one to 50. It's one to 1.6. Sorry. You can just do this yourself if you wanted to. And then a uh, same between these two seal chambers move it down so now i have a lot more space so it's not quite 150 it's 160. so what's happening is that it's literally something we call it phi it's a irrational number that's meant to be irreducible and that actually makes it so that it makes it helpful for the purpose that this speaker was actually meant to really help um the master, for lack of better words, is how to deal with internal reflections and to reduce them. And the way you'd, you'd do that is you'd reduce them by making them sh like shrink forever. And the golden rectangle, sorry, the golden rectangle, if you stack them, form the golden triangle. And the golden triangle is a irrational number that when represented in geometry, it continues to shrink, but it also continues to grow forever. And that's why you see it in like plants and stuff where, you know, as the spiral of like, you know, as the spiral of life, so shall we eat it all. Like in Lion King. Um, the, um, the way that the things naturally, like the seeds and stuff like that naturally come out or like the conch shell, it will naturally follow this pattern. And that pattern is naturally irreducible. And it kind of makes sense because if it was reducible, then it'd stop, right? Like, like it would, it would, if it was actually a circle, then it would be boring, kind of. <laughs> like, circles are fun, but, you know, it's not really that fun. So, like, if a conch shell grew in a circle, it would just end up with a ball. And then it would be very fun for everyone. But it wouldn't be, like, a mystery. So, instead, it actually had to veer off just a tiny little bit. And it veered off by, um approximately the golden ratio so that it would actually always be able to grow and it would always be able to make space for itself same way as sunflower seeds they organize themselves and they grow out in a rate like in a um spiral pattern always leaving room for the next and that golden ratio just tends to work out form and beauty tend to rhyme right so um what they did here was not only did they do the whole like rear single panel wood that would actually help reduce diffraction because like you know like an instrument like a lute 
most instruments have rounded internal spaces. That's so that you don't have any standing waves. You may notice the front is bowed, and this is pretty much like the same thing as this, where it's like there's no there's no actual angles. It's bowed, and then there's another thing that is like a smiling form of that matches this thing, so that there's no way that there could be any standing waves that could form in here. It's kind of like a mushroom shape, basically. And the por the portioning of the top and the bottom are deliberately never a, an, an integer. So as they're going up and down, you could kind of finagle yourself so that one you know particular tune, they're both kind of playing at the same time. And so you're going to get a boost. But overall, the range is always going to be this thing playing a little bit later than this thing, as of this thing's like six inches behind this thing. And that makes it so that even if this thing were faced against a wall, it wouldn't have the ability to create a standing wave. Because these things are actually electronically parallel and should be playing, you know, pissing in and out exactly the same every single time. But due to the fact that this chamber is only 1 to the 1.6 of this chamber, the crossover, the mechanical crossover, forces the bottom woofer to actually play in slower motion than the bottom one, and also allows the bottom one to play down lower. So uh, so this one plays like, it works almost like like a compromise between the mid squawker and the woofer. It's like a, it's like a tighter sound. Whereas this is like a low, low frequency woofer, and it has like a pour on the bottom, and a much bigger, more cabinet space, and being close to the ground, of course, it's going to rumble more. So this is definitely meant to rumble. This is meant to be like the tight tonal bass section. It is meant to be the mids and the highs. That is the crossover. That's the three-way that's the three -way speaker. And then you add one more subwoofer. Call that four-way. Right, I guess. Active. Whatever. Okay. When you pair two mains, there's also a crossover that I think people neglect. And I don't think I'm going to stop the video here because I'm going to actually continue from where um, this is leaving off because I think this part is kind of important. So thanks for listening so far. And of course, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to jump around my videos, I'm perfectly fine with that. If you want to just use certain bits and pieces here and there, I don't care. You can just watch my videos all the way through. I don't care. Just It's just a matter of trying to make content that I feel like we don't need. Thanks.